from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Leading the conversation when it comes to sustainability. If they're not making money at the end of the day, then they're not sustainable. How small changes for beef producers are paying off. New details about just how many cattle were lost in those historic Texas wildfires. As ag statisticians plan to do away with some key livestock and crop reports. Withholding critical market transparency information from the public is not the appropriate way to do that. Reaction and what it can mean for the industry right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the name on the cap matches the power of one's purpose. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Some key numbers producers may need to make decisions about their crops and livestock may no longer be available. The National Agricultural Statistics Service announcing it's canceling the July cattle report as well as all county estimates for crops and livestock starting this year. Ag Day's Michelle Rook has been looking into this and Michelle Nass says this is a budget issue. Right, Clinton, NASA officials say they're cutting some key crop and livestock reports, blaming it on budgetary cuts tied to the most recent appropriations bills. But that's not setting well with the farm groups we've talked to, including the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. NASA intends to only release one cattle inventory report annually. The January report surveys more producers, increasing its accuracy, but the July survey gives producers a first look at the calf crop. And NCBA officials say it provides other vital data for the industry, especially during the current herd contraction phase. And to take away this important data point from us at that time uh, is really going to help, is really going to just contribute to uh, some more volatility and helping uh, and, and making it more difficult for us to see into the future on what, so what we can expect to see supplies do going forward. Beamer says the cost savings has been estimated at around a half million dollars, which they question. They say the move is deeply misguided and called on NAS to reverse its decision. There are other ways that the agency can go about trying to pinch pennies and make sure that they are making those dollars stretch as far as they possibly can. But withholding critical market transparency information from the public is not the appropriate way to do that, especially since this administration has touted its transparency agenda since the very beginning of the Biden administration. NAS will also discontinue the Cotton Objective Yield Survey and all county estimates for crops and livestock. Lance Honing with NAS tells Agritalk those weren't easy decisions. Just like anybody else that has a budget to manage, you know, you can only spend what you've got. But there are other pieces of information uh, for cattle, for example. There are other pieces of information about acreage yield and production beyond what we published at the county level. In fact, he says they've worked with their agency partners and will be sharing data. So that should eliminate the concerns about the loss of county yields used to figure farm program payments. A few years ago, from a crop insurance standpoint, uh, our good friends and partners over at RMA have been utilizing a lot more of their own internal data uh, to support those programs. And then, of course, we've always you know, thought about the ARC PLC programs and our our close friends over at FSA have also been tapping into a lot more of that RMA-driven data and a lot less of the NAS data. USDA tried to cut the July cattle inventory report in 2016 and ended up reinstating it. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. Keeping you updated on the avian flu and dairy cattle outbreak, USDA is confirming another case of the virus, this time in North Carolina. USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service website shows avian flu or bovine influenza A virus as the industry is now calling it, was also officially detected in two dairy farms in New Mexico. That brings the total number of confirmed cases to 21 in seven states with Texas reporting nine, New Mexico now at four, Kansas at three, Michigan with two, North Carolina, Ohio, and Idaho each with one. Besides dealing with an outbreak of avian flu and dairy cattle, Texas, continuing to recover from those devastating wildfires that hit the Panhandle area in late February. Texas Ag Commissioner Sid Miller says producers are still tallying up the damages, but it's estimated the fires consume 1.3 million acres or about 2,000 square miles in the state. And he says 
The state lost about 10,000 head of cattle and more could die over the next six months due to respiratory issues. The fires damaged or destroyed 120 miles of electrical lines along with 500 houses, barns and structures. There's some really long term effects. For instance, our, our fences, once they are, go through a fire like that, they may still be up, but the T-posts have lost all their outer coating, so they're going to eventually rust. The, the barbed wire is still up, but the tensile strength is gone. As soon as winter hits and it contracts, it'll all bust, so it's, it's all got to be replaced. A lot of it's on, on the ground. He says right now the greatest need is still for feed, hay, and fencing supplies for those ranchers. For more on how you can help, check out texasagriculture.gov. Areas of the Texas Panhandle seeing some beneficial rain earlier this week, but for other places, it's been a wet start to spring. USDA meteorologist Brian Rippey says March will go down as the 31st wettest March in 130 years. El Nino brought drought relief across California and even the Deep South. He says that weather pattern is consistent with El Nino, but he does believe La Nina is knocking at the door. I feel like the transition to La Nina is already underway. The thing about that is that the impacts often are not felt for many months. Here we are several months after the peak of El Nino, which likely happened when we look back on it in December. Rippey says La Nina typically brings drier conditions across key production areas. So if the impacts of La Nina don't start to show up until fall, lingering impacts of El Nino this spring and summer could be favorable for the growing season this year. Some of those storms we talked about in Texas turned severe. People in central Texas seeing hail, damaging winds and heavy rain, even leading to some flash flooding in Texas and Mississippi. And the severe weather threat isn't over from the storm meteorologist Martin Lormore is tracking it for us. Martin? Yeah, we're still watching those storms rolling across the southern U.S. Had several storm reports across Texas and parts of Louisiana. And and it's going to keep its way rolling across the parts of the southeast. We'll step off. You can actually see where these storms are rolling by this morning. Seeing a lot of actually getting toward the parts of the southeast. And you can see with that low pressure system moving its way. Very deep low pressure system, I might add. You can see these low pressures normally scoot around Oklahoma and uh, poor parts of Missouri. But this one actually makes its way south of Oklahoma into Louisiana. You can see where that low pressure is swirling. This will continue on its way out of the parts of the U.S. That's where the storms are actually going to be will make its way off in the Atlantic as we head into our Thursday overnight. So continue to see those storm threats as we head into our afternoon. But luckily, this low pressure make its way out of here as we get into our Friday and Saturday. And we most of us get to enjoy a nice area of high pressure. But you're already looking at it. Another low pressure making its way into the U.S. as we get into our next work week. So something we'll be watching as we head in the extended forecast. But we get to enjoy a nice dry weekend. And a little help around planting time is pretty great, isn't it? Eric Larson of Mississippi sharing this picture saying faith, family and friends are important. And he said he was blessed with great help while planting corn last week. It's great to see. Hope you guys have a good harvest. I'll have more in your forecast coming up. Republicans in the Senate are introducing their own crop insurance improvement bill. It's called the Federal Agriculture Risk Management Enhancement and Resilience Act or Farmer Act. It seeks to improve crop insurance affordability by increasing premium support for the highest levels of coverage and enhancing the supplemental coverage option. It was introduced by Senate Ag Committee member John Hoven of North Dakota. And how does it do it? It does it in two ways. One, by enhancing the buy, providing more support to buy a higher level of coverage and that it, it actually provides then higher levels of coverage uh, on a more affordable basis, not only at the uh, enterprise level, so not only at the farm level, but also at the supplemental coverage option level, which is incredibly important that you have that. And in addition to providing that on a more affordable basis, it also uh, directs that USDA evaluate and determine how they can make crop insurance more affordable and work better when you have large counties in your state. Hoven's legislation is supported by several farm groups, including the American Farm Bureau Federation, the National Corn Growers Association, and the American Soybean Association. Inflation returned to pressure the Dow, and that brought mixed trade to commodities. We'll talk markets coming up next. And later, finding answers to sustainability questions for cattlemen and women. We'll hear from the experts at Kansas State today in the country. Ag Day is brought to you by Germinator Closing Wheels, 
Germinator Steel Closing Wheels provides a 13 bushel advantage per acre in no-till and a 7 bushel advantage per acre in conventional. Do you have enough room in your bin to switch to the Germinator? Another soybean sale of 9.3 million bushels for unknown destinations was announced, but corn and wheat led the markets midweek. Agnes Michelle Rook is back with an update in Markets Now. Grains ending mixed on Wednesday. Mark Schultz with North Star Commodity is back with us. And let's talk about the wheat market. We saw HRW wheat a pretty good rally. Market looks good from a technical standpoint, but some of that was weather, wasn't it? Well, yeah, the weather is probably helping it all because we're certainly not getting it from the demand side on the wheat. Uh, you've got some dryness. You probably have about 40 percent, maybe 30 percent of the of the hard red wheat area here that is on the dry side. I wouldn't say it's anything that's devastating yet. It's just that the forecast does look like for the next 10 to 15 days, we're going to start seeing above the much above normal temperatures with a lot of wind blowing. So things might start to uh, stress it out. Also, you got some issues potentially on dryness that continues to nag the Russian wheat crop, which is important because Russia has been forward selling wheat into the world market well under everybody else. If you could slow them down on their production and then slow down their export business, it would likely be a little bit better positive attitude for wheat in the big picture. Yeah. So the markets are trading weather right now in the grains, but the other thing that we're trading or getting ready for is reports, both from CONAB as well as the USDA reports. We've been pretty range bound. Is there anything you think that we could get in either of those reports that would break us out of those ranges? Well, I think a few things. So first of all, I, I think the trade's trying to lean maybe that the crop gets a little bit bigger uh, in Brazil. Uh, mainly because it's more acreage. And I would agree with that. I do think that's going to, uh, USC is going to find more acreage uh, in here. What you would need to have happen is either uh, CONAB does not, this morning does not raise up the crop any bigger for both corn and beans. And USDA would have to come down and under uh, levels that we've seen. Keep in mind, we're still roughly about 11 million metric tons USD over CONAB at the present time. Uh, and on the beans, they're roughly in that seven to eight million metric tons. So it's pretty wide range. You'd want to get that to narrow closer towards uh, that CONAB doesn't go up and USDA comes down. I've always said for quite some time that you want to get the bean crop in Brazil, total bean crop, in order to get something positive, I believe has to go under 150 million metric tons. Well, we will see what we get. Mark Schultz, North Star Commodity. We'll have more Ag Day coming up. that forecast. Of course, still watching for the possibility of some strong to severe storms as we get into our Thursday afternoon. That low pressure that's been making its way across the southern U.S. We had some storm reports across parts of eastern Texas near Waco, making its way up towards even parts of southern Arkansas and northern Louisiana. Now, this is going to continue its way into parts of the deep south, Alabama, Mississippi, especially right off the Gulf Coast, seeing that best chance for several of those strong storms. All threats expected, possibility of winds, large large hail, heavy rain, and of course that isolated possibility of a brief tornado could be possible within this red and even this uh, yellow shaded area here. So it's something we're going to be watching as we get to our Thursday. Luckily, that severe threat moving its way out of here by our Friday, so we won't have to deal with it much longer. But we're still technically seeing winter in some parts of the United States. Of course, out toward those higher elevations, you can see some, plenty of places in the Rockies. But here's the good thing. We're not seeing additional snow over the next several days. This is going to be our estimates through our next week. That's next seven days. And you can just see not a lot of that snow really going to be making its way across the entirety of the U.S. Maybe a brief little dusting, possibly up to a couple of inches in some parts of Idaho just on the most eastern fringes of Oregon, but that's kind of the extent of it. Not really seeing much snowfall over the next couple of days and into our next week, so should mostly stay to our north as we get in that extended forecast. Luckily, we're going to continue to see this high pressure building its way into the U.S. as we get into our Friday and Saturday. This will make things feel much better, very warm as we get into that extended forecast. But the next low pressure system already going to push its way through. Luckily, not going to bring a big chill, but you will see those temperatures dropping off just a little bit as with the rain moves in with these low pressure systems. 
Sardis, Mississippi. Nice warm day. Got some light rain possibilities. Highs in the upper 60s. Looking at Akron, Colorado. Looking pretty good. Temperatures above average. Sitting in the low 60s and sunny skies. And finally, Iowa Falls, Iowa. High 59. Colorado employees are confirming another calf was killed in the state by a wolf. This marks the second attack in the state since wolves were reintroduced in late 2023. This latest calf death was reported in Jackson County. The first death was reported in Grand County, which is southeast of Jackson County. Now, Colorado Parks and Wildlife say the calf was found dead early Sunday morning, and it says partial wolf tracks were found in the same area. It says it is aware of four wolves in that location, including those that were released late last year. State officials say they are working to anticipate and prepare for incidents like these, including using range riders in the coming weeks and other tools to aid ranchers with non-lethal means to deter the wolves. Also out of Colorado, a man was taken into custody after investigators say he shot and killed multiple cattle belonging to his neighbors. Earlier this month, the Laramore County Sheriff's Office received a report of a man identified as 37-year-old Michael Hester shooting and killing livestock around his property. Deputies were able to locate seven dead cattle. An eighth was critically injured and had to be euthanized. A livestock appraiser said the total loss to two neighbors was over $30,000. Now Hester was arrested and now faces felony charges. An undersheriff saying the crime shows a disturbing disregard for life and livelihood. The Colorado statute commonly known as the open range law allows livestock owners to graze animals without containment. Residents who want to restrict livestock access to their property are required to fence off those areas. Well, America's ranchers continue to focus on sustainability. Up next, some questions and maybe some answers about what that means today in the country. How do you define sustainability? Well, for cow-calf producers, sustainability can actually add to their bottom line. And Kansas State University is sharing this video of some questions producers should keep in mind. Sustainability is not just environment. Right? A, a lot of consumers today, when they think sustainability, they think environmental impacts. But we also have economic considerations and other social considerations. And our beef cattle producers, if they're, not, if they're not economically viable, if they're not making money, at the end of the day, then they're not sustainable. So that's always gonna be at the forefront of, of what we're looking at when we look at, hey, how do management tools impact the resource base, the cow, the producer? We wanna make sure those tools are gonna to be hope, ideally economically beneficial. And so certainly when we think about specific to cow-calf production systems, you know, we think about sustainability production and reproduction as a, as a component of that it is certainly, certainly part of that, right? Yeah, absolutely. One of the best tools, are, one of the best outcomes a producer can have is a cow that calves every year, right? And when we think sustainability, that's going to check boxes across the board. Having cows that fit your management, fit your landscape, right? right and throw a good calf every year that, that weans a healthy weight for you, right? Fits your market. That's going to reduce your environmental impact. It's going to improve your economic outcomes, right? And it's going to keep you around for the long term. Right, absolutely, absolutely. So we're seeing we're seeing a, a lot of interest in, in looking at the sustainability of, of systems all the way through the beef production chain, starting at the cow-calf production level and working all, all the way through all segments of the industry. So you have quite a bit of background in, in this area. What are some things, at least from, from the research side of things, uh, that, that the community is, is really starting to look at, uh, some ways we might evaluate that, and, and how do we quantify it? You know, grazing research, grazing operations are they're very complex, as you know, and as our producers know. It's not as easy as in our confinement operations to control what that animal is doing and eating every single day. And so things that we're looking at are they have to be very easy to implement for a producer. And when I think of something easy to implement, I think, first of all, grazing management plans. Right? Do you have one and what does it look like at the end of the day? Or do you have long term planning? to maintain a healthy landscape, right? Because yep. when I think how do we reduce emissions, we try to maximize the state uh, of our growing season when we have adequate, high quality forage, right? Maintaining an ad adequate state of regrowth. That'll reduce 
enteric emissions but coming from the reticular rumen of the cow right right because it's it's a higher quality diet and that enteric methane at the end of the day is just an energetic loss right also when you're maintaining that regrowth you're maximizing solar energy is how i view it coming into your landscape so you're keeping nutrients flowing maintaining a healthy soil base and hopefully something like that will be easy for producers to implement rather than you know some of these supplements that are going to be more viable uh, on the confined feeding side of things. And our thanks to Kansas State for sharing that video with us. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Davis. Have a great day.